Hey, Dr. Christensen here, and I want to talk about the powerful truth behind the myth of adrenal fatigue. So this is an important thing, and it's a little nuanced. So the adrenal fatigue idea about the glands getting just worn out and beat up and unable to make adequate amounts of cortisol, and that being the cause behind fatigue, it's not true, and we know that. But there is a real change that happens in the body from chronic stress. It does involve the adrenal glands. It can totally cause symptoms and wreck your health. And you can fix it by lifestyle measures. That part is true. And I want to go into how we've kind of gotten down this path of a false dichotomy, so to speak. So adrenal fatigue, the popular view, had been around for some time, but it really crystallized around 2000 under the book Adrenal Fatigue. And it was not, the phrase was not coined within the book, but it was really set as more of a placeholder. And the idea behind it was that there was something that happened to the body under chronic stress that caused many symptoms. And these could be symptoms like, like fatigue, like weakness, like muscle pain, like mood changes, insomnia, all these real things, sugar cravings, salt cravings. And the thought was that since these same things could happen severely, in the case of adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease, that's where the glands just cannot make enough hormone. So think about that as like a Hashimoto's of the adrenals rather than a Hashimoto's of the thyroid. That's a case to where the immunity attacks the glands, it destroys them, and they just can't work anymore. And it's rare, but it's real. Now, some thought that a weaker version of that you could call adrenal fatigue. And that in the case of the harmful effects of chronic stress, what seemed to be the case was that the adrenals were less able to function. They were kind of beat up or worn out. And I guess it made some intuitive sense, but it wasn't accurate. And it created this big rift between the alternative world and the conventional world. And somewhat rightfully so. The conventional world heard that and said, well, great, we should be able to test that and see if it's happening. That's an easy thing to test. You can measure how much the glands produce and how much your body is telling the glands to work. And if those things are off, we know they're underperforming. Just think about a car. You know, if a car's got an engine that's going bad, you could hit the gas really hard, but the engine wouldn't move. You're like, oh, wow, that's a problem with the engine. So in the case of the adrenals, you can measure how much you're telling them to work and how much they put out. And what they saw was that people that had this condition, this that was called adrenal fatigue, there was no disconnect. Their adrenals were making exactly what their body told them to make. So the conventional world poo-pooed this and said, oh, this is no such thing, we should be rid of it. And there's many position papers saying that it's not real, it's not a valid diagnosis. And the drawback, however, is that there is a real condition behind this. So the adrenals are part of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that's a system of glands and regulating glands that controls your body's stress response. You know, it governs fight or flight, it governs control of electrolytes and fluid, control of blood sugar, hunger, metabolism, fertility, hormone activation, all kinds of important stuff. And the data is completely clear that that pathway can get thrown off by chronic stressors. So let's go a little bit deeper. A stress is something that pushes the body into disequilibrium. And that includes the psychological stress that we face. The nasty boss, the bad traffic, the, the deadline, the financial pressure. But it also includes a lot of things you wouldn't think of as being stressors. Like erratic blood sugar, or a poor night's sleep, or high amounts of plastic fumes in the air. They all act on these stress pathways. So there's more and more people in the natural health space who have been seeing through this myth of adrenal fatigue. And they've been saying, hey, look, that's not valid. The adrenals don't really get fatigued unless you have adrenal insufficiency. And they're totally right. But the drawback is people in their mind have had a placeholder for something that happens to them when they've had too much disrupting their chemistry. And that's been popularly called adrenal fatigue. So even though the concept is erroneous, there's a real phenomenon behind that. 
But it's important to make the distinction because if the concept were true, then the solution would come by just putting out more adrenal hormone, by either forcing the glands to work more or just giving the body what the glands supposedly could not make. And many who have had that belief have done things that are logical based on the belief, but they're not helpful and they're not always medically safe. You know, case in point is prescription hydrocortisone. So that's a lot like the cortisol your body makes. And many doctors who have a misunderstanding and take adrenal fatigue as a literal phenomena have simply prescribed hydrocortisone for patients with low cortisol. And if adrenal fatigue were real, that would be the right thing to do. But it's not real, and the drawback is they can worsen symptoms and also create more medical risks. So what we've learned is that it's not about the adrenals being fatigued, it's about this whole HPA axis. And you can call this thing adrenal dysfunction, adrenal stress, or cortisol slope. So many studies have looked at not just do you make enough cortisol, you know, too much or too little, but when do you make cortisol? And specifically, how does your morning cortisol compare to your evening cortisol? When you're healthy, those two make a slope, like a ski slope, or you could take a sled down that. You know, morning cortisol is high, evening cortisol is low. But from chronic stressors that we can face, that slope can become altered. You can have it be backward or flat this way or flat that way. You know, always high, always low, or exactly backward. And that's a real phenomena and it's a real problem. To date, this idea about cortisol slope, that's been the subject of over 16,000 clinical studies. So we've got a lot of data saying that this is a real thing. And when it's not right, it's the driver of many big symptoms. We look at fatigue, depression, insomnia, anxiety, easy weight gain, digestive disturbances, inflammation. So a lot of those are symptoms that were ascribed to adrenal fatigue. So this adrenal stress thing is real. And there's also been data saying that that cortisol slope is a big factor for creating other problems in terms of greater risk for disease and actually shorter lifespan. You know, one of the most remarkable studies I've read was the Whitehall 2 study. And in it, they tracked thousands of people with a lot of different health tests, like blood sugar, body weight, cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, but also they tracked this cortisol slope. And this was done by salivary cortisol. Many who have attacked adrenal fatigue have also attacked salivary cortisol testing, saying it's not valid. And there's a lot of data saying that it is a useful tool. It does predict diseases. And in this particular study, the Whitehall 2 study, that salivary cortisol slope was a stronger predictor of death than anything else was, even smoking status. So it does correlate with your health status. Now the beautiful thing is that it can shift, it can improve. The main things that disrupt that are gonna be changes in blood sugar, uh, problems with sleep, and then also a lot of high early life traumas. They set the stage for that. Then along with that, just chronic ongoing stress and changes in lifestyle. But it can, it can switch, it can repair, and it can get better. So the first step really, the first action step as always, is getting an accurate diagnosis. Is this affecting your health and how would you know that? I encourage a two-pronged approach, you know, one of which is mapping out your symptoms. The easiest way to do that is by taking the quiz at adrenalquiz.com. It's free and you can know if your adrenals are working well. And if not, it'll even tell you if you're at the overproduction, underproduction, or backwards. I've called these stressed or crashed or wired or tired. And you can learn about that from the quiz. I would also encourage medical testing because there are some people that do have adrenal insufficiency. They may have undiagnosed Addison's disease. And the only way to find that out is through testing. Now, that's not many, but it is some. And for those to whom that's accurately diagnosed, it's life-saving. So do also do simple blood tests for cortisol and ACTH, but also do salivary tests. And by that full gamut, you can know exactly how relevant this is to you.
Now the next step after you get some diagnosis is then you know, the main thing is you are what you eat and diet can be so helpful. So you can have adrenal stress for reasons that have nothing to do with your diet, but your diet can still be used as a tool to leverage your adrenals back to a good daily rhythm. That's a beautiful thing. So I wrote a lot about this in the Adrenal Reset Diet. And you can check out AdrenalResetDiet.com and get a lot of free guides on how that works. But the basic idea is that carbohydrates have a special relationship with cortisol. And that's because cortisol is used to regulate blood sugar. So if you lack carbohydrate, your body will make more cortisol to raise your blood sugar. If you have carbohydrate, you can let cortisol levels go lower. Now the strategy is because you want cortisol higher in the morning and lower at night, you flip that for carb intake. So less carbs are needed earlier in the day, but good carbs in the evening can help you rebuild that cortisol rhythm, that cortisol cycle. The other big thing about diet is that there are foods that just create more trauma and stress to your adrenals because they throw off your blood sugar. Now, if you're healthy, they may not be as big of a deal, but if you want to improve your adrenals, the more you avoid those, the better they would do. The big three in that category would be sugar, caffeine, and then fried foods. For different reasons, those are all things that create oxidative stress or throw off your blood sugar and make life harder on the adrenals. So the other important D is really designing your recovery. And the message I want you to get is that your adrenal function is huge. It may be the largest determinant of how you feel and how your immune system works, how your thyroid is functioning, how you're sleeping, whether your brain is working well or not, and even your potential lifespan. It's big that way. And you can make it better. So design your recovery. Create a real clear plan, learn more, and take the important action steps. And know that you can get better. You know, even in this worst stage of crashed, People all the time tell me that within a month or a couple months, they came back to thriving again. So in summary, the adrenal fatigue model was probably a clumsy way to bring in a real concept. And the cycles have been first, the alternative world embraced adrenal fatigue, then the conventional world immediately turned on it and said no such thing. After a little while, those of us in the alternative natural world, or I guess I do both, we've said, hey, that adrenal fatigue hypothesis is not valid. Unfortunately, many in this world have also disregarded the whole importance of stress on health and the HPA axis and the relevance of lifestyle and improving the body's resilience. So there's a real thing and we can call that your HPA axis, we can call that your adrenal stress, probably my favorite term, your adrenal stress, or your adrenal function, and it's critical and it's important and you can help it get better. Take great care. We'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.